Wha- Wha- Jack stammers, as her mind races over whether or not she heard what she just heard. What? Like I said, we're in this together for the long haul, you know, and it occurred to me that, you know, um, might as well, right? That is if you want. Simone shrugs, trying to brace herself for a no, or at least that's something I can't consider right now. Chuck's twin hearts race to the point where her legs become numb and her head gets a bit dizzy. I, oh, oh, she says, as her breath becomes difficult to catch. What is Terran marriage like? She manages, hoping to get perspective. I'm not asking her, Terran, Simone counters, bringing her knees up to her chin to cover her running face. I just, fuck, remember I said home is where the heart is? Well, sure, I live on this ship and have a room in it, but it's the people here that make me feel like it's home, especially you. You know, I want to be with you as a forever partner. Whatever that ultimately means. Like stimulated embers being blown into, the princess's eyes glimmer in a bright glow. Simone, she whispers softly. It's okay if you don't want to, like in any official way. I know being royalty makes it complicated and I don't want to disrupt what you have because of what I am and I know I'm not exactly marriage material but Simone starts to panic, starting to regret proposing as her mind attacks itself. Then there's a hand cupping the side of her head guiding the redhead to meet face to face with the Cali. I certainly wasn't expecting this, Chuck admits. You can say no for any reason, but let me try this again. Chocolata Mortaz, will you make this dumb idiot your dumb idiot partner in life? The Terran asks with a warm, nervous smile. The Cali stares, mesmerized at the prospect. Though millions of complications force their way into her mind, especially for someone in her position, but despite that, she knows exactly what she wants. Nothing would make me happier. Yes! Yes, 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 every yes! She chirps in full cries before embracing the Terran. With great restraint to not accidentally squeeze the Kelly and Twain, Simone hugs her back as tightly as she dares. She can't think of anything to say, but perhaps nothing needs to be said. Instead, she basks in a happiness she thought was unfit for someone like herself. All it took was an alien princess to save and fall for in order to bring this bliss. Such a prospect makes her chest convulse in held back laughter. Are you okay? Chuck asks as she pets her Terran. You were right. This is a goddamn fairy tale. The red hair snickers through tears. But better. Oh, I concur, Chuck agrees before kissing Simone on the neck. So, how should we do it? Customs, I'm certain, are very different. Right, um. Well, Terrans have a lot of ways to do it. Colonies tend to be big parties that are to the point. Traditions being stuff like exchanging gifts, drinking, eating, gambling, and sometimes the couple go to an evil walk or take out a rover for a few days as a honeymoon, Simone explains, pulling away. Oh, honeymoon? My people have many marriage traditions regarding moons as well, such as dancing to celebrate our mother moon, Chuck replies, before looking up the term in her lens. Uh, Simone attempts to warn. Ow. Oh. So it's from the practice of consuming fermented honey during the first month of the Union, which was measured by the Earth's moon cycle. All this was to increase chances of conception. I see. Yeah, these days it just means go off and do a celebratory shag away from everyone else, Simone informs with a wink. Does, does fermented honey actually help? Chuck asks, now just curious. Doubt it, and even if it did... It was never an option for me, Simone says with an amused shrug. I don't understand. I thought you eventually desired offspring, Chuck points out. I said I wanted kids, don't have to be homegrown. It's a little hard to conceive after this little number. Simone pulls down her briefs on her side a bit to fully point out a small but now obvious scar. Took a shot in the very first engagement I was deployed in, shredded past my lower gut into a smoothie. After the surgeries, let's just say I was no longer equipped. Oh... You say that as if it doesn't bother you, the Kelly says with caution, unsure of how truly sensitive the situation is for Simone. It does a bit, not having that option. I mean, there are replacement surgeries I could theoretically do, but honestly, I'd be just as content parenting any kid who needed it. Delivering the water up babies really hammered that home. But of course, that's not a real discussion to have until we make it out the other side. Right now, this is more than enough. Chuck nods and continues to look up other terror marriage traditions. She giggles in amusement as she comes across one she likes. Chocolata Thatch. I think I really like that, she notifies. <laughs> You'd want a name like that? Simone teases. 
Oh, very much so. Though, Simone Mortaz also sounds very good. Chuck offers in a slight tone. Does that mean I'll be Cali royalty too? Perhaps. Though I'd have to throw away our entire government and traditions to make it official. And seeing that's what my father did, and having to do with all the rioting, I'm not inclined. Dumb, Simone says as she sarcastically snaps her fingers. My long-term plot to seduce a princess and become a monarch has been foiled once again. Apologies, Simone. But if it brings you comfort, my own plot to seduce my gorgeous chief of security for special perks has been coming along very nicely, Chuck replies, as she rubs her whole body up against the Terrans. Who then promptly pushes the Kali down on the bed and rotates herself up and over to loom menacingly, very careful not to press any of her weight down on the princess. Special perks, huh? Wanna rephrase that? Simone breathily plays, narrowing her emerald eye suggestively. Though her hearts are racing like a herd of galloping coli, Chuck keeps a cool demeanour and runs her lower appendages down the Terran's bare torso. Nope. And I know you're gonna do nothing about it, she challenges. We both know who's in charge here, she says, before craning up to a kiss and bite to the redhead's neck. Simone closes her eyes, leaning into it. A craving hum escapes her. Yes, ma'am, she whispers, preparing to start an early honeymoon. Suddenly, there's a boisterous knock at the door, causing the two to freeze in place. Pardon, are you two awake? The vessel's captain has informed us that we've landed. The translated voice of an excited female grat comes through. Oh, right, Chuck grumbles, scratching the sides of her face. Completely slipped my mind. Simone leans down closer to the Calais' face, looking at the door. We can pretend to be sleeping in, she poses in a whisper. As if a normal speaking voice wouldn't have sufficed. Tempting. But no, this is too important. Teaching them about habitating stations is imperative. Chuck says, a bit disappointed. Ten minutes? Simone teasingly presses. Simone! The caddy scolds in a giggle, before tapping her lower so the Terran's chest to request that she move. With gentle movement, Simone concedes and rolls over, releasing the caddy from the Terran love cage. I'll get my gear on, the redhead informs, standing up from the side. And I'll retrieve your things from my room. Chuck responds, pulling up her loosened bottom sleepwear. As she makes it to the door, Simone speaks back to her while fitting on a black shirt. Old room? The redhead corrects without looking back. Nikali's eyes flash before opening the door, and she practically skips past the two awaiting Grat. Your Highness, I apologise if you were just a... Nodrin begins to say, before the Nikali, seemingly in her own world, moves the door over to another room. Hey Simone, how are you feeling? Miki inquires. Very obviously taking a peek at the Terran's room, admittedly still getting used to addressing the once cave folk by an actual name. Zipping up her orange jacket and rustling her head fur as to even out the wildness, Simone turns to approach the female grat. Sore as fuck, but I'm doing real good. Settling in alright? She replies, as she steps out into the hall. Ah, yes. The individual made of metal, Seven, has been very accommodating with their meals. And we have refrained from running around the vessel while making due with releasing our energy within our room's premises. We believe we are starting to get used to the lighter weight, Mickey answers. I want to thank you again for allowing us on board. We understand it's an incredible opportunity and extension of trust on your part. Good to hear. We're going to renovate Chuck's old room into a place where we can burn off some steam. Hopefully that helps with any restlessness you get. Simone notifies as she wanders down towards Vin's door. How... How does one burn steam? Nodrin asks as both Grat trails behind the Terran. Uh, it's a phrase. It just means releasing energy, as you put it, Simone clarifies. Is it true that stations are entire cities constructed within the void? Like this vessel, but much bigger? Nodrin continues to question. Bingo, the redhead answers plainly, as she stops at Vin's door. The Grat couple looks up at her, confused. I'm not sure that translated correctly. What is bingo? Miki says. Sorry, I mean, yes, that's pretty much right, though they can vary a lot, especially with how many death orders there are and how accustomed they are to having them there, Simone explains, before giving a light knock on the doctor's door. Ah, death orders not common? Nodrin asks. Depends how close to Central Galactic you are. Also, death orders are socially encouraged to keep within their respective nations, which means the more troublesome of us are the most oftenly seen and interacted with. Which then compounds the stigma and distrust, so don't be surprised seeing folk avoid you like the plague when your people are more well-known, she details, before the door finally opens. Simone, do you wish to start a session? Finn inquired. Nah, kind of tight on time at the moment. 
I was just hoping to get the kiddos for a little station walk. Figured they'd appreciate a change of scenery. The redhead responds. Ah, splendid idea. I'll retrieve them right now. The doctor agrees. Thanks for taking care of them while I recover. They didn't get too rambunctious, I hope. A bit, but thankfully Seven is the one who feeds them, so I don't have to worry about being snapped at. Finn responds, as he brings up the canister with the eight small occupants. Simone accepts it and twists to expose the seafood section. Then she holds it up to her face. One of the bolder what halflings pecks aggressively at the clear barrier in a show of fearlessness. You are getting a bit bigger. Good thing we almost have you little buggers home. She remarks with a smirk. I fashioned this. It's usually meant for Seven to carry them around so they aren't cooped up, Finn says, as he lifts up a sort of harness. Nice, Simone approves, taking that as well. You coming station side as well? I will not. No offence, but I do not wish to get in the way with you teaching our newest crewmates about how life is out here in the stars. Perhaps at a later time, Finn responds with a respectful squat. Gotcha, can't say I blame you. Thanks again, Finn. Simone farewells, moving past the grant. Best of luck. Try not to get into more scraps, the Noxie replies before returning to his room. Chuck then emerges with a satchel in a grasper, meeting up with the other three in the hallway. Oh, we're taking the tappings with us? Chuck asks, as she holds out her upper graspers to receive the canister. Handing them over, Simone adjusts the harness to fit her own frame and fastens it on. You bet, she responds, before accepting the canister back and securely fits it to her front. How old are they? Miki says as she inspects it, jumping when several of the young snap at the barrier. Almost three months, Chuck answers softly. Simone shifts on her feet, a bit surprised. Has... has it really been that long? Simone says aloud, kind of taken aback. Man, time flies when you're kidnapped by a crazy caveman cult. She turns to play it off, but the hint of sadness leaks through. Chuck manoeuvres around to the redhead's side to comfort her. How about we depart? She offers to her girlfriend, betrothed, while holding out her satchel. Right, the Terran agrees, first picking out her gold-plated plasma cult. Although looking absolutely ridiculous, Simone is moved to be holding it once again. Taking a moment to look it over, she holsters it, feeling a punch of satisfaction. She then picks out her two small devices, a comm and her lens. To be honest, she is a bit apprehensive to plug something into her brain so soon after freeing it, but she pushes past that potential mental crisis before her thoughts could dwell, pressing each into her temple. The fuzzy feeling occurs, and thankfully no strange caveman or corrupted animal appears to her, sighing. She fully activates her lens and looks up the station they found themselves in. Surya Station. Bordering near Watau space, it is a popular trade destination, especially when it comes to scrapped military hardware. Despite its proximity, the population of Watauf is very low, outside of specific trade companies. Good. Last thing I need is to accidentally start a quarrel with the most venomous species in the galaxy. Not the ideal training rules for these grant, but better than most out in these parts. Simone internally figures as the group makes their way down into the loading bay. This station having exterior landing pads, a sealed connecting tunnel rises up and latches onto the ship's bay doors. All right, guys, Simone speaks up, as she plants her heads down on each of the grass shoulders. You're gonna stick by me unless I say otherwise. You do not touch another individual if it can be helped, she reminds. And although you may not be known death orders yet, you will be an unknown species walking around who don't speak galactic standard. So you're gonna get strange looks and hear some very rude comments. Just ignore them, and don't try to engage. Trust me, it's always never worth getting security involved. Understood, Nodrin says first. We appreciate your guidance, Simone, Miki agrees. From an experienced death order to you newbies, hopefully you won't need me for all that long. You two have good heads on you. It's then the bay doors open to reveal an elevator that is to take them down within the station. Marching the group in, Simone presses the indicator. After the doors reseal, and the Grat experienced the strange falling sensation, a broadcasted voice presents itself. Today's top news topic, a new species is to join the galactic community. After their newly discovered planet was attacked by Terran pirates, a private Cali business venture took it upon themselves to remove the threat. The Cali monarch, Lovia Ortaz, is yet to claim any association with the organization, though many speculate it to be so. However, Terran Union leader Valeria Bernal has spoken out against these pirates and has already extended a courting relief branch to aid in the new species uplift to show good faith. Who are our new neighbours, you may ask? Well, so far it is known that they are called Grats. Oh, Grat, excuse me. They are generally green-skinned with fur on their heads and tails. Be sure to greet our new citizens of the stars with open arms, but at a distance. 
Although they have yet to be officially registered, they are speculated to be Death Worlders. Very compatible to Terrans, in fact. So please be understanding, and exercise caution. Welcome to the stars, Grat. May your species find your place peacefully within our shared galaxy. Well, shit, Simone says, unsure if this is a boon or not. That was... fortuitous? Chug Chirp, equally uncertain. No doubt the news got out by the Terran Union, wanting to look like the good guys before anyone can look too much into the pirates, Simone grumbles. What does this mean exactly? Mickey asks. For you, expect even more looks and gossip. Same rules apply, the Terran answers, hoping to come across as confident. The group then falls into an uneasy silence as the elevator continues on and on. This is quite a long ride, Chuck quips, hoping to ease the room a bit. Yeah, it's because of a lot of redundant armour plating to travel through. This used to be warring space not too long ago. Kind of weird that they'd only play one news story for a single trip, though. Simone replies as she casually pops her neck and shoulders. This catches the grass attention. I didn't realise. You're of the elderly? Mickey speaks up to the Terran. Excuse me? Simone replies, surprised by the insinuation. Your joints are making aged sounds. They must be quite painful for you. Nordrin attempts to clarify for his bondmate. What, this? Simone says as she rotates her spin back and forth, sending out rapid crackles. The Grat almost lift their hands to stop her from causing the horrendous pain their empathetic nature tells them of, but fall to when the Terran starts to chuckle at their horrified expressions. We Terrans just make those noises. Actually feels good, I assure you, she sniggers before cracking her fingers as further evidence. Nordrin looks over to Miki, wincing from the sounds. I must admit, that is baffling to comprehend, Miki says. Still sounds like you're breaking yourself apart to me, Chuck Wiley agrees, not enjoying the sounds either. Before the Alpha Death Order can torture the other occupants further, the elevator finally comes to a stop. The doors lift open to expose the circular busting crossway, and as soon as the party steps out, many visual organs are upon them. Then, like a haunting domino effect, more and more begin to slow, if not stop, at the unexpected arrival of two freshly arisen Death Worlders. Nodrin and Miki clasp hands tightly in response to the sudden attention from all these strange beings. The air itself feels as though it thickens from the miasma of curiosity, fear and speculation from the solidifying crowds. I wasn't expecting this many stairs, Miki says to Simone. Should Nodrin and I remain on the ship? If we're going to shop here, it's best that you're with us. If you want to turn back, no problem, but you're going to have to face the music sooner or later. My advice? Make the best first impression you can while you can. The redhead replies. They're not sure what music has to do with this. The Grat couple sees the wisdom in her words. Then we press on, Nodrin confirms. Simone nods and leads the group forward. Most are more scared of you than you are of them, and those who aren't, they'll be plenty scared of me, she reassures them as they venture on. To Simone, her own record of how much space is granted by a crowd is shattered. She can even see quite a few terrified people squirming to get further away. Guess the Grat rumor mill has already begun running away, she thinks, as they exit the other side of the crossway and into a walk lane, with vendors implanted along the parallel walls. They are truly fearful of us, Mickey whispers to her bondmate, as she watches the vendor duck out of her gaze. Is this better than fearing everyone else? Nodrin points out. I... I don't know, the female Grat replies humbly. I've been looking forward to speaking with more different people. They all look so strange and fascinating. Perhaps a later time when our people are better recognised. The Kelly treated us very well, and so did our new crew. Once they see what our people are like, I have no doubt many of their fears will greatly subside. Nodrin comforts, entwining their tail with hers. I hope so. Excuse us, excuse us, a voice calls out. The group then spots a pair of individuals approaching with a recording drone hovering alongside them. Simone moves to block what she initially sees as security, but she hesitates when she notices the universal media symbol on the drone. This may be even worse than security. A panting Noxy and an oddly bold Norther get within ten feet of the group before stopping. Seeing the drone, Chuck lifts her hood over her head to obscure her face. Local Surya Station News. I am Correspondent Lackle and my drone assistant Terrell. It's a pleasure to see the Grat already making their way out of these parts, the Norther introduces. Hey, Terra adds. Look, bud, we are on a tight schedule. We really can't stand around for biased questioning. Simone tries to deter, but her surprise is Norfolk was made of heartier stuff than most she'd met, as he waves the big bad Terran away dismissively to focus on the newcomers. We would love the opportunity for an exclusive interview, share your people's story to the entire universe, and 
answer the pepper of burning questions it has for you, he says. Simone begins to approach the man with more intent, but Mickey holds up her hand to halt her. You wish to learn about our people? She asks, excited to see a friendly disposition. Absolutely, we will be happy to take you to a more private venue, and we'll even cover the credit charges for a welcoming meal. Mickey and Nodrin look to each other, and then at Simone. This could be a good thing, Chuck poses. Simone looks at all of her companions as if they are crazy. Guys, no, we have to. Drone is recording? Lackel asks, as he sits across the two grat in the private side room of a restaurant. Yep, Taro affirms. Excellent, and you two, tea good? I hope you don't mind it being a Terran product. Lackel addresses the two. It's just fine, thank you, Nodrin says, as Miki takes a long sip from her warm drink. Very well, then let's get this started. Simone and Chuck sit in the back corner, as per the agreement behind the news team. Simone would have her arms tightly crossed if it wasn't for the Wataf container strapped to her chest, and the free Terran burger in front of her was a begrudging positive. Thank you for sitting down with us. May the people of the universe have your names? Lackle begins. I am Miki, and this is my bondmate Nodrin, the female grat informs. Welcome, Miki and Nodrin. Immediately curious, do your people only utilize a singular name per individual? Outside of titles, yes. Just one name. Why would we have more than one? Nodrin throws back the curiosity. Many species have many different naming conventions, though I will say yours is easy to remember. Now, what was it like to be beset by Paris from the very stars themselves? Miki briefly glances at Simone, recording their little discussion alone before the interview commenced. Absolutely terrifying. We had no warning and struggled to hold our own. Thankfully, we were aided in repelling the evaders, she states. Ah, yes, by this mysterious Kelly organization. Do you recall what they call themselves exactly? I'm afraid not. I believe they said something about surveying. I apologize. Regardless, we are incredibly thankful for what they did and what they continue to do, Miki responds. Oh, no need to apologize. What can you tell us about your people and cultures? Why are you out venturing the stars so early in the uplifting? Miki nods to Nodrin. Well, we are a relatively peaceful species with many religions and very cultures. Though we have endured war in our past, the disputes are rarely ever long form, for we are a very communal and community-oriented people. You see, it's quite rare to see just two of us alone together. We tend to remain in larger communal groups, especially when on the move. So you are pack predators? Yes, I suppose that's a way to put it. Though we have long mastered agriculture and no longer depend on hunting, Nodrin says. Ah, so you are omnivores. I must say your sharp mouth bones had me worried for a second. Why would you be worried? Mickey asked. Well, <laughs> well, you see, there is a rising concern that your people may be the next Terrans, but even more dangerous. Why? Mickey presses. What's so bad about Terrans? You serious? Hmm. Your people were assailed by them. One would think you would have a firm understanding. Anger flickers across Mickey's face. Well, certainly, the ones who attacked us were terrifying. But are all Terrans pirates? Better question. Are they the only people that would turn to such aggressive piracy? She counters. Of course not, but Terrans have an unfortunate reputation of being aggressive bullies, you see, and they are contending for the most wars a single species has ever taken part in, mostly against themselves in their history. They even brought utter destruction to their own homeworld. The concerns I alluded to earlier are that your kind reportedly come from very similar death worlds. Your stature may not be quite as formidable, but you possess many of the traits Terrans possess, and have the traits they actually lack, such as claws and effectively sharp mouth bones. Miki stands at attention from her seat, politely placing down her gifted tea. I may be new to the stars, but I can see where this is going. I'll have you know I've already made a dear friend with a very honourable, kind and dependable Terran. And the very leader of their species, what I've heard, is more than willing to offer us aid. I ask you, has anyone else beside the Kali offered us aid thus far? I'm aware of none. Is that because you classify us as something as threatening as Death Worlder from a scarily titled Death World? Titles you insist upon us? Perhaps our world is harsher than most, but that is our home. It has made us, and I promise to you and all those listening, we are by and large the people who desire peace with the stars. We wish our lives for our communities and our fellow beings. We are more than capable of love, understanding, charity, responsibility and unity. Are we all such? Of course not. But something tells me all peoples have their demons among them, regardless of a death world. The crap people will become allies against the phallus the universe has to offer. And all those worthwhile traits I hold so close to my kin, I have already seen an abundance within a Terran. 
so I will not let any actions of a few sell my view on an entire people, and I dimly hope the rest of the galaxy grows out of such a juvenile outlook, because I'm certain my people will gladly teach you how. We're done here.